we spread thoughts of goodwill to put our mind in the right frame to practice. May I be happy, may all beings be happy. Which means that we want a happiness that doesn't cause harm to anyone. And we want them to find a happiness that doesn't cause harm to anybody else either. Where are you going to find that happiness? You've got to find it inside. The happiness we get from things outside is the kind that can go only to some people. In other words, you eat something, it means somebody else can't eat it. You gain something, someone else loses it. They gain, you lose. That's the way a lot of the pleasure and happiness of the world goes. But happiness that comes from inside doesn't take anything away from anyone else. And it actually puts you in a better spot where you can be more conducive to the happiness of others. So as the mind settles down and starts thinking about other things outside, you can keep reminding yourself, this is for the purpose of everybody's good, what I'm doing right here, right now. And I don't have to take on anybody else's issues right now or any other issues of my own right now. I need to train the mind. That's the only way you're going to find happiness inside, is by training your mind. Thinking that way gets you ready to settle down with the breath. Because the mind can come up with all kinds of reasons for not staying here. You've got work you've got to do, things you've got to plan, whatever. But when you realize that the work you're going to do and the things you've got to plan will go much better when the mind is trained, it's easier to put those issues aside. It's like knowing that you've got to stop and eat your lunch in the middle of the day. You might say, well, there's work to be done, but if you don't eat your lunch, you're not going to have the strength to do it. And the same goes with the mind. When the mind is well trained, it can do all of its tasks with a lot more strength and a lot more clarity and a lot more precision. So think your way until you're ready to settle down. Take a couple of good long, deep in and out breaths, and notice where you feel the breathing. Where it seems to be most prominent, focus there. And allow your attention to stay there all the way through the in-breath, all the way through the out. This part requires training, because the mind is so used to noting something and skipping on to the next thing, telling itself, well, I know this already, what's next? We don't know this thoroughly enough, because as you stay with the breath, you begin to realize there are lots of other sensations of energy in the body as well, and they all count as breath. And they're all affected by the way you breathe in, the way you breathe out. There's a lot to learn here. There's a lot to explore. You can breathe in a way that's really conducive to the flow of the blood and the body, to all the different parts of the body which is good for the health of the body. When the body feels comfortable like this, then the mind has a much better place to stay. But to be sensitive to these different flows of energy in the body, you have to be here with the breath for a good long period of time to sensitize yourself to this part of your awareness, because this is the part of the awareness that we tend to block out when we're doing other work. And we're very good at blocking it out. Or you want to think about the future, think about the past. You've got to block out your awareness of the body. So you have to overcome that habit. When the mind feels a temptation to go wandering off, you've got to settle back into the body again. Reestablish your connection with how the different parts of the body feel. As you breathe in, as you breathe out. With this attention or tightness in one part of the body, you can think of the energy flowing through there. In the beginning, it's going to be just that, a mental picture of the energy flowing through. But as you stay more and more continually with the breathing process, you begin to realize that the energy does flow. There are some places where it's blocked, but when you can relax the blockage, there will be a flow of energy. Sometimes the blockage is right where 
things feel tense or tight, and other times it's on another part of the body. If you try to relax one part of the body and it won't relax, then the first line of defense is to go to the opposite side. If there's a problem on the right, think of the left. Problem in the stomach, think of the energy in the spine. Problem in the spine, think of the energy in the stomach. And John Fuhrung talked about how when he was young, getting started with the meditation, he had these really bad headaches. And he discovered if he could think of the breath energy flowing down the spine and out through the tailbone, that relieved a lot of the pressure in his head. So there's lots to experiment with here, there's lots to explore. It's not just in, out, in, out, in, out, because if that's all there is, pretty soon the mind will go out too and it won't come back. Out looking for something else, to, something that's more interesting, that seems to be more worthwhile or productive. It requires a lot of patience to stay with us, but patience is a quality that's good for all of us. Our culture trains us in the other direction, trains us to be impatient, otherwise we won't buy their things. But we're not here to buy anything, we're here to train the mind to find true happiness. So we've got to develop different qualities. Patience is a good one to start with. But patience here doesn't mean that you just sort of sit around and wait for things to happen on their own. It means that you work on the causes until you get results. And if you don't do it skillfully enough the first time around, well, you try it the second and the third and the fourth. And it doesn't matter how many times you work at this. What matters is that you are observant. And notice, when things are going well, when they're not going well. When they're not going well, what can you do to improve them? And when they are going well, what can you do to maintain them? This quality of noticing what works and what doesn't work is called Vimangsa in Pali. It's using your powers of discrimination, understanding what the causes are and what the effects are, which causes are good ones and which ones are not, based on the results they produce. That's one of four qualities that the Buddha said lead to success in the meditation. The first one is desire. You have to want to do it. Again, you have to learn how to focus your desire properly. If all you can think about is the results, nothing gets done, nothing's accomplished. Focus your desire on the causes. We want the mind to settle down and be still, but the cause is staying with the breath. So focus your desire on that. Focus your desire. I want to stay right here with this breath and this breath and this breath. That leads to the second quality, which is persistence, really sticking with us, putting energy into this. In the beginning you'll notice that you're with the breath for a while and then it will fade away, and then if you notice you've wandered off and then you come back to the breath. Next time around try to stay a little bit longer. And then when it wanders off, well the next time when you bring it back try to stay a little bit longer. Just keep at it, trying to make it longer and longer and longer. And John Cha, one of the forest monasteries, has a, has a nice analogy. He says it's like pouring water out of a, of a kettle. If you tip it a little bit, there'll be water in drops. Drop, and drop, drop. Tip it a little bit more, and the drops will come closer. Drop, drop, drop. And then it gets drop, 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 and finally it's just a stream of water. Where does the stream come from? It comes from those little drops, simply that they get more and more connected. That's the quality of persistence. Then there's citta, intentness. You really want to do this. Pay close attention to what you're doing. If it starts getting mechanical or automatic pretty quickly, you're going to be off someplace else and you won't know how you got there. You want to pay very careful attention to how things are going. And then again, there's your ability to analyze it, to see what's working and see what's not. And make adjustments as, as you see fit. 
There's a lot of experimentation that goes along in the meditation. If one way of breathing doesn't feel good, you can change it. And John Lee recommends starting out with some long breathing, because most of us tend to be starved of breath energy. This helps to wake up things in the body and wake up things in the mind. And if long breathing feels good, you stick with it. If not, you can make it a little bit shorter or have short in and long out. That can be very relaxing. Long in and short out can be more energizing. You can make the breath more shallow, make it more refined, make it heavier. It's all kinds of things you can experiment with and, and learn from. Because the needs of the body will change, the needs of the mind will change, and you want to be able to stay on top of that. And these four qualities, desire, persistence, intentness, and using your powers of analysis, these are useful for any activity. So it's good to learn how to train them here, right here, right now something simple like the breath, and then you can apply them to more, more complex projects. The important thing always to keep in mind is that we're here in training. So this is not a time to think about just whatever you want to think about. The mind needs to be brought into shape. Because if it's not, it can cause a lot of trouble. I mean, there's nothing else in the world that seems to cause as much trouble as the human mind. You can see it on a large scale, and you can see it in your own life. Sitting around, nothing seems to be happening. All of a sudden, a mood comes up, and it just takes over. And you find yourself doing and saying things. And then after the mood has passed, you wonder why it was so strong, why it seemed to be so overwhelming, and why you felt compelled to follow it. Because when you look back on it, you realize how stupid it was. But at the time, it seemed to make a lot of sense. Well, what was that? It's a mind that doesn't know itself. And this is why we need standards from outside, and why we need training to bring the mind back into shape so it can learn to be more alert to what's going on. This is one of the basic principles of the forest tradition, is that we need standards against which to train ourselves. We're not here just to follow our likes and dislikes. We have to realize that our likes and dislikes are out of control. But if we develop the qualities of concentration and discernment, these four qualities of the desire to get the mind trained, persistence in doing it, really being intent on doing it, and using your powers of analysis, okay, that can change the mind, make it more reliable. We tend to think of the forest tradition as being very Thai or very Northeastern Thai. When it was starting out, people were complaining about it, how oh, John Mun and John Sao didn't do things the way everybody else did, the way Buddhism had developed. It had fit very nicely into everyday culture. But John Mun and John Sao saw that it wasn't leading to nirvana. When people would complain to them about the fact that they weren't eating like other monks, or dressing like other monks, or staying in the temple, village temples like other monks. They weren't following Thai or Lao customs. He said, look, Thai and Lao customs, like the customs of every country in the world, are the customs of people with defilements. People's minds are out of control. What they wanted to follow was the customs of the noble ones. In other words, real standards. The word ariyat means noble, but also means objective, universal standards. So if you want to become a noble person, you have to follow the customs of the noble ones. Take their standards as your standards. And they're basically four. The first three start out with contentment, contentment with things outside—food, clothing, shelter. 
you learn to be content with what you've got, and you're careful not to get proud of the fact that you are content. And it's one of the tricks the mind likes to play on itself. All too often when you give something up, the only way you can do that is get to get proud of the fact that you're giving up something that other people can't, can't do without. And that just becomes one more burden for the mind. So on the one hand you are content, but on the other hand you realize you're doing this not to compare yourself with other people. It's because the mind needs this kind of training. You spend all your time looking for better food, better clothing, better shelter. You have to have food just like this or that, clothing just like this or that, shelter, more than you really need. You're wasting a lot of time, wasting a lot of energy. And it just encourages the mind to stay out of control. That's why we so often have that chant about reflecting on how to use the basic requisites, what attitude to have. If you have enough food to keep the body going, you're fine. Enough clothing to protect you from the cold when it's cold, from the heat when it's hot, you're doing fine. Same with shelter. What's interesting is that the fourth requisite, medicine, is not mentioned in the noble standards of the noble ones, or the customs of the noble ones. What is mentioned, though, is that you delight in developing good qualities and you delight in abandoning unskillful qualities. In other words, you give rise to a desire. This is the chanta, the desire to do this. And for a lot of us, that's difficult, because sometimes the skillful thing is going to be really hard. Like when you have to develop goodwill for someone you don't really like, or you have to put in more hours of the practice than you want to. This is where you learn how to talk yourself into liking it. So you're not just begrudgingly putting in the time. But you learn to see this as an adventure, as something that you're exploring, something that you're learning. However you can present it to yourself that makes it attractive. The same with abandoning unskillful qualities. We really like our greed, aversion, and delusion. In fact, we, really, we identify ourselves with our suffering. As the Buddha said, suffering comes from clinging to five aggregates. And what is our identity made out of? It's made out of the clinging to those same five aggregates. We identify with our suffering. So of course it's going to be hard to let go, as long as we say, this is me, this is mine. This is why you have to look at these things as not me and not mine. At the very least say, there must be something better. If you're going to identify with anything, identify with something better. But the important thing is that you learn how to make yourself want to do the practice. This is where the customs of the noble ones and the basis for success come together with that ability to delight in abandoning unskillful qualities and to delight in developing skillful ones. Learn how to see that as a really positive accomplishment in your life. That's what helps you stay here. That's what helps your persistence and intentness and your ability to analyze things. And those four qualities, again, turn around and help you with the customs of the noble ones. Help raise your mind to a higher standard. Raise your attitude toward what kind of behavior is acceptable and what kind of behavior is not. You're focusing primarily on your behavior and not letting the standards of the world take over. There are lots of things that the world will let you do and turn a blind eye, and actually, or sometimes actually encourage you to do. They really are against the Dharma, really are against the principle of finding true happiness inside. So you want to take the standards of the noble ones as your guide, because those are the only ones that are reliable standards of the world change. And it's all pretty arbitrary which direction they're going to change. 
but the standards of the noble ones stay the same. The way they were in India 2,500 years ago are the same way they are now. And it's by holding to those standards that we have hope for true happiness. So learn to have the desire to bring your mind into line with those standards. You'll benefit, the people around you will benefit as well, because it leads to a happiness that harms no one. And more than that, it leads to a happiness that doesn't disappoint in any way at all. It leads to total satisfaction. A mind that has a real sense of enough, not because it's trained itself to lower its standards, but because you've raised your standards. That's where true happiness can be found.